And so trying to get into the industry of multifamily real estate investing was simply too much for my body to handle. So I tried time and time again to you know, buy my first deal, do market research, do some traveling, and I would just end up sadly uh, back in the hospital. But the benefit was I got to see, you know, a market cycle and a half, understand the different dynamics. You know, not a lot of people have been through uh, a recession or been through an economic downturn. Maybe they only know good times. And I think it's made me a much better underwriter, assessor of risk. And the people I met over the, that 10-year period of time, I'm sure you'll agree, Matt, this industry is full of just tremendous people willing to give, impart wisdom and such. So it really set me up for success, even though it was a little tough at the time. You're listening to Ice Cream with Investors, a podcast that is dedicated to teaching you how to better invest your money so that you can live a more intentional life. I'm your host, Matt Four, and it is my goal to teach and empower you to remove the roadblocks to your financial success. Welcome back to Ice Cream with Investors. I'm your host, Matt Four, and today we have on Amy Silvis. Amy is the founder and principal of Silvis Capital, which primarily focuses on apartment investments in Alabama, Indiana, Georgia, Tennessee and Texas. And she's always been drawn to freedom, growth and expansion and knew that she could serve more people by investing in multifamily real estate. Today, Amy is here to talk us through the five freedoms that financial independence can provide. Not only that, but Amy has a super, super interesting backstory that I'm happy to dive into. So Amy, welcome to the show. Ah, Thank you so much for having me, Matt. This is such a pleasure. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, we like to start with the difficult questions here. What's your favorite ice cream? Oh my gosh. I have to say apricot mango sherbet. I don't know if you all remember Thrifty's ice cream, now Rite Aid. I love the tart and tangy. So that's my jam. That is a very unique mixture. Apricot, <laughs> man- mango, and sherbet all in one. <laughs> it's fantastic. Highly recommend. Okay. Well, we, we're going to dive into the controversial topic of toppings or no toppings. Oh, I'm a purist. So no toppings for me. That's enough flavor for for my mouth to handle. Okay. Okay. I'm assuming you're a bowl girl then. No, I do like cones. So yeah, the thrifty ice cream cones are, I think, nostalgic. That's probably what it is from my childhood. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, (laughs) tell our listeners, where did, what's the scoop? Where did your listeners, where did your journey begin? I love this question. My journey began about 10 years ago. Um, I'm one of those, you know, steady as she goes, tried a few times, failed a few times. But essentially, I was looking to decouple my ability to earn money from the time that I invested. Um, Long story short, without getting too much into it, you're welcome to ask more questions and dive in. I was born with a health challenge. And I knew from a very young age that unfortunately, my ability to work might not always be there uh, because of a progressive lung condition called cystic fibrosis. So all's well that ends well. I'm 41 years old and in great health now. But it really was the key to my journey where I thought, I don't want to be dependent on my parents. God forbid I couldn't work. Um, I don't know how much longer my lungs are going to last and allow me to to have a full-time job. So I stumbled upon real estate and passive investing. And that was really a game changer for me, a mindset shift and got me into this industry. Well, I don't want to breeze over this. I know you have. there's been some advancements in terms of what's going on with this condition and some of the new developments. Can you tell us, because it has a happy ending, can you tell us where you are today? Yes. So something happened right before the pandemic in November of 2019 that all of us in the cystic fibrosis community had been praying for, hoping for, fighting for, uh, for decade upon decade, and a miracle medication came to the market. Well, it's not a cure. Uh, it has changed all of our lives or about 90% of our lives um, and just made life so much easier. All of us, uh, many of us have been able to return back to work, return to school and live very productive lives without the interruptions of being in the hospital for two weeks at a time, uh, you know, year after year or several times a year. So incredibly grateful for it. It came to the market when I was 38. I'm 41 now. uh, And I'm just so grateful. I've got the second half of my life to be able to enjoy great health. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's a very rare disease, if I understand it correctly. Is that right? Yeah, only 30,000 people in the United States have it and about 70,000 worldwide. So that was really the struggle with drug development. That's a whole other story, but it's just a lot more financially attractive to develop drugs for conditions that, in fa- you know, that impact millions of people as opposed to a tiny little population like us. Yeah, well, I'm happy to hear about the advancements you've made and that you're Thank in you. a good bill of health. And I know that you have a bright future ahead of you, which includes multifamily real estate. 
So let's yes. talk. I know we were chatting before the story, before the show here, that you jumped into multifamily to begin with, while most of us went through the troubles of scaling our single family portfolio. Why did you decide to go multifamily to begin with? You know, I really knew and understood the benefits of multifamily from the get go. And quite frankly, I don't think I knew any better <laughs> to know that maybe it would be a better idea to do single family. The economies of scale just made sense to me in terms of property management that I could have, the resources that I could have, the limit, uh, the unlimited or maybe less um, <clears throat> impact of vacancy. You know, you've got a single family home and one person isn't renting, you got 100% vacancy. A little bit different if you've got 100 units. Uh, and you've got one person, you know, not occupying a unit. But also, I'm in Los Angeles, California, so um, you know, not the most landlord-friendly area. And of course, buying a single-family home and you know, one of my favorite markets, which you happen to be in in Nashville, would be a little hard to manage. You know, maybe not as cost-effective uh, to have a single family out in Nashville living in LA. So I just went for it. I thought, you know what? If anyone could do it, I can. So let's go. I love it. I love it. And you said it was a 10 year journey. Talk us through that journey, where you started, lessons you learned along the way, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and when you're in the journey, sometimes it can be difficult. I'm sure many people have had goals or things that they had aspired to. And gosh, when you're in the trenches, you're just kind of going, why is this taking so long? But to your point, so many amazing lessons. Well, I was a biotech professional. I was working in that industry, uh, balancing a very successful career. And then cystic fibrosis at the time was a full-time job as well. And so trying to get into the industry of multifamily real estate investing was simply too much for my body to handle. So I tried time and time again to you know, buy my first deal, do market research, do some traveling, and I would just end up sadly uh, back in the hospital. But the benefit was I got to see you know, a market cycle and a half, understand the different dynamics. You know, Not a lot of people have been through uh, a recession or been through an economic downturn, or maybe they only know good times. And I think it's made me a much better underwriter, assessor of risk. And the people I met over the, that 10-year period of time, I'm sure you'll agree, Matt, this industry is full of just tremendous people willing to give, impart wisdom and such. So it really set me up for success, even though it was a little tough at the time. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I do agree that the community of real estate investors is a very open community where people are willing to help. Mm -hmm. In fact, I sometimes talk to some people in the older generation that are a part of my network and they're like, oh, if you've got a property, don't tell anybody else about it because they'll go steal it from you and things like that. And one of the things I try to implement is that there's many more out there, right? We are working in a multi-trillion dollar industry. If I get snaked on a deal, then there's another deal coming down the line and probably a similar market with better returns anyways. I love that. That abundance mindset will get us everywhere, right? Sometimes it can be hard to have, but gosh, if you lean into that and trust that, the world is your oyster. Yep, absolutely. So talk us through how were you able to find people to partner with or build that team during that journey? I started passively investing. Uh, even though I wasn't you know, intending to be a passive investor uh, throughout you know, the remainder of my life or my career, because I was struggling to do my own deals, get into the industry, had been you know, a great steward of my finances and saved some money, I decided to passively invest with a few operators just to know what good looked like, or hopefully not bad, but you, I think you understand what I was saying, the good, the bad, and the ugly, if you will, and really formed a network with that. Uh, in addition, you know, I went through a mentorship program and was able to find some great people with uh, like-minded values and outlooks. And so, yeah, just networking and taking action helped me find great partners. Let's talk about the uh, LP position then, because I yeah. typically encourage people if you, it's the highest and best use of your time, right? And return on intentionality is something that I care about deeply, not Ooh. necessarily yeah. assets under management or doors or how much capital you have. It's are you being intentional with your life? And for most yeah. people, that's being a passive investor in deals. And so yes. when you were an LP looking for operators, how did you find operators? And then how did you underwrite and vet operators? I love that. You know, it's really about networking. Uh, you know, I was not a, an accredited investor at the time. So I was only able to see 506B as in Bravo or participate in 506B deals, which as we all know, can't be advertised. So it was all about networking. Um, I would attend my local real estate clubs, RIAs, um, and things like that to get to know people. Uh, I would also attend networking events online that were associated with some one of the coaching programs that I was a part of. I'd listen to podcasts. 
So essentially, yeah, it, it was just, you know, getting myself out there, meeting as many people as possible, and then asking the right questions. Uh, you and I both know having skills is important, having great, you know, great returns, a great track record, et cetera. But there's a values component that I think is so important that I can't really um, uh, under uh, under talk about or uh, under emphasize, <laughs> if you will, uh, because things happen in this industry inevitably, right? It's just part of being uh, a real estate investor. And you want to make sure that you've got people at the helm that are really making the best decisions with values that align with yours. So it was reading books, podcasts, in terms of underwriting and learning how to do that. I obviously wasn't as great of an underwriter then as I am now, uh, but with my limited experience and understanding and the rest really was trust uh, and trusting in the operators that I had grown a relationship with to know that this is a good deal to invest in. Yeah, I think the value piece is uh, important to double click on because it's not a number that can fit in on a spreadsheet, but it's probably the most important part of it. Um, because right. I think too, that we've gone through this historic bull run for the past, I don't know, 14, 15 years now. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're gonna have a choppy year next year. I could be wrong, I, nobody has a crystal ball, but you're gonna right. start seeing who was swimming naked for, for Warren Buffett's sake in the sense of yes. who, was, who was over leveraged, who was running hot on deals and things like that. And if you don't have the right value system in place with your partners, with the people you invest in, then that's when things can get a little bit tricky. I think that's perfectly said. Yeah, none of us knows the future. That's just the truth. You know, we hope the good times roll on, but who knows? Um, and to your point, yes. What What are people's values? What it's, it's it's easy to do the right thing when everything's going well, right? What happens when inevitably there are some bumpy patches? How are decisions made, um, even when no one's looking? So, couldn't agree with you more. Much better way to put it. Much more succinct way to put it. Um, how many uh, LP deals did you do before moving into the general partner or the, the operator side? So I did two LP deals and a JV. Gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. And same they people were for the two LP? Yeah. Two different operators. So uh, yeah, same with the two LPs and then a different operator for the JV. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. And then on the LP position, when you were a limited partner or a passive investor, did you get a chance to kind of look behind the hood on how things were being run? What did that communication look like? Yeah, thankfully that was pretty smooth. That was something that I was really upfront about when I was going to when I was looking for opportunities of, hey, I'm relatively new. I'm looking to learn more. Is this something where when you take LPs, are you willing to share? a bit more in depth with someone that's looking to be a bit more, I don't want to say hands on, but maybe, you know, inquisitive, if you will. So thankfully, that was a great relationship. And that was something that they were able to do. I know not all operators do, but it was really important for my learning. So, so grateful for that opportunity. As a passive investor, what does good communication look like from a GP then? Mm -hmm. Were you getting monthly, weekly? Could you call them? What does all that look like? Yeah, I was getting quarterly communications uh, after the first six months. The first six months were monthly, which I thought was fantastic, which was great. Felt like a like the right cadence. And yeah, accessibility to be able to call the operators uh, when I wanted to, text message, things like that. So it was a relatively smaller-ish um, you know, GP team in terms of the number of assets under management, but they still really had a strong focus on making sure they were available to LPs uh, and interested in nosy ones like myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I think it's important to cover because I'm in a, involved in a number of different LP positions with a number of different operators now. And yeah. you would think that everybody kind of has their standard communication, but they absolutely don't. I mean, I've got one operator that sends me quarterly communication, but it is a novel that they send. And it's I was just texting with someone the other day because they were asking about this particular operator. And I'm like, it's the best communication I've seen in terms of in-depth but then I get another LP uh, position where they send monthly, but it's not that in-depth. So you don't know what mm -hmm. are the taxes, what are the insurance, you're not seeing the books, et cetera. So I think it's important when you're going through the process of being a limited partner to ask, what is the communication like from the general partner and make sure that yes. aligns with what you're looking for. Such a great point. And as you know, on the GP side now, and now I have LP investors, it's so interesting because there are so many different needs across the board, right? So, uh, you know, some people just want their check. And as long as that's coming, that's all they care about. And other people really, really want to know the details. So to your point, finding an operator that fits your needs and that is willing to communicate the way that you need is, is such a great tip. I love that you brought that up. Absolutely. 
Well, one of the things we were chatting about before the show was looking at different markets and the type of demographics and things that you're looking for. Can you talk us through when you're looking at a market, what are you really looking for? And what are the key things that would make a market an absolutely no? Oh, that would make it a no. Way to way to switch it up on me. I like this. I'm usually asked what makes it a yes. It's like yeah, an market research and ice cream. Just mixing it up. <laughs> Just go. I love it. Um, yes, you know, market research, uh, I cannot emphasize to the listeners enough, and folks probably already know, but it's worth repeating. It'll make or break a deal. The deal itself is important, but my goodness, is the market going to uh, make it sing or or make it a little bit more of a struggle? So, yeah, I, I am really, you know, I start off looking at markets that are landlord friendly or not landlord friendly. Um, I think it's a good place to start. The state of California, for example, I'm in Los Angeles. It's probably no, not, not news to anybody, not very landlord friendly. That would make it an absolute no. We still have eviction moratoriums two and a half years into COVID in Los Angeles. So, um, yeah. And while, you know, I'm not looking to be a slumlord, I don't think anyone intentionally wants to do that. We do want fair and equitable laws. So, uh, there are markets, you know, outside of California, of course, that, that do offer that where you don't want to evict someone, you know, five days after non-payment, but you do want to have an opportunity uh, to work with someone uh, if you, know, you still need to pay your your debt payment and all your other fixed costs and someone isn't paying. So I think that's probably the first the first piece. And then, yeah, demographics. Um, if we're not seeing job announcements and job growth, if we aren't seeing population growth, uh, you know, population is a you know, kind of a look in the in the uh, rear view mirror, if you will, because the census only comes out, you know, every few years uh, at best. But, you know, looking at that trend, if there isn't a positive trend and there's out migration, out net migration, yeah, that, that's going to decrease demand and be a screaming indicator that that's not a place where you necessarily want to invest. And the final one, you know, I could go on for a while, but unemployment, high unemployment, no go. Yep. Yep. One of the things I think the downside to the eviction moratorium is this supply constraint that we're seeing in the market right now that I look at during 2020 and I want to be very cognizant to help people that are in need, but sometimes they can be taken a little too far. And all of a sudden now you've got people that aren't paying for housing with landlords that own housing in other places. So the people that can pay are obviously getting double charged because their other properties can't be moved out. So it has a downstream effect that I think we all need to be cognizant about. Oh, absolutely. You know, and we had, you know, it was a very, very real thing, right? We, we think of uh, mid-summer 2020, unemployment was above 10%, GDP contracted by 35% quarter over quarter you know, we didn't want a whole slew of people out on the street. So I understand the intention, as you mentioned. Um, and we worked very closely with our residents to find nonprofit help, state and local help. You know, there, there are things that can be done. But to your point, moderating it a little bit and, you know, all of that, I, I think is important for all of us to keep in mind. Yeah. Are there any markets that you're looking at right now or particularly focused on? So there's a market about uh, 60 miles northwest of where you are uh, called Clarksville, Tennessee, that we absolutely love. Uh, we own in and want to continue to expand. Um, we tend to or have been looking at um, secondary markets outside of major markets like Nashville that are still benefiting from job growth, net migration, uh, but institutional competition doesn't quite exist uh, yet. That may be coming down the pike. Um, Huntsville, Alabama and surrounding markets of Athens and Decatur. We just closed a 220 unit in Decatur, Alabama. Um, incredible market, lots of recession resistant industry. The United States Space Force is relocating to Huntsville, which I still can't believe is a division of the military, mm -hmm. but that exists. <laughs> That's a thing. Uh, the FBI is expanding. Um, so lots of, lots of job growth and cost of living is still really low there. So it's a, another great market. Yeah, I preach from the high mountaintops for the past five years that people are sleeping on Huntsville because with the FBI moving 5,000 jobs there, the Space Force, yeah. they obviously have a huge rocket tie-in. And so as the billionaires of the world build out their rocket companies, I feel like Huntsville mm -hmm. is going to get a lot of that natural tailwind. Um, so I love yes. that you mentioned that. Yeah, and I think the Huntsville Airport just received the first FAA designation for commercial um, commercial rocket <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at clearance or something along those lines. I can't even say it because it sounds so different to me. But uh, yeah, pretty amazing. Yep. Yep. 
Um, well, one of the things that I've learned through research about you is your five freedoms that financial independence can provide. So if we can, yes. I'd love for you to list those off and let's take a few and just dive into them. All right, let's go. So financial freedom is one of the five freedoms. Absolutely. And then we've got freedom of time, freedom of geography or place. So wherever you want to live, uh, freedom of association, so who you want to be around and freedom of purpose. Um, I have to credit the amazing Trevor McGregor, who is my business coach. This is, these are not my ideas, but I love to shout him out because he's an incredible man. Uh, but I think they resonate with everybody because we're all born to be free. We aren't born to be on this hamster wheel for our time and you know, almost everything about our day is controlled. So I love these five freedoms. Let's go. Which is your favorite freedom? I love this. You're great at these questions. I think time freedom uh, because I think everything can come from that. So if I have agency over when I get out of bed in the morning and to plan out what that day looks like, I can then make the other four freedoms uh, happen. So the cornerstone of passive income, it really does buy me time. That's exactly what I thought you were going to say is that <laughs> if you have time freedom, you can do all the other ones. What I've typically found is that the busier my days become, I don't think about, can I be geographic? Am I associating myself with the right people? Do I, am mm -hmm. I aligning with my purpose every day? It's only on yeah. the weekends or during times when I'm on vacation and not really working every single day that I can really focus yeah. on the things that are high value. That's profound. I think you're spot on. That really makes sense. You got a lot more kind of mind space with that to, to allow your brain to really think and create if you have that time freedom. I love that. How has investing helped you with the freedom of association specifically? Oh, yes. You know, I think having control over where my income comes from allows me to really dictate uh, who I can be around because I'm not dependent upon a paycheck to dictate, you know, and control my, control my actions. If someone has control over where my money comes from to pay my bills, I kind of have to submit to them uh, in, in some way, shape or form. And uh, you know, working in corporate America, I, you know, I loved my time in biotech. I think there's incredible things that come out of that space, but you know, who your manager is, who your coworkers are, that can change, that can be dynamic. Um, and as I mentioned several times, I'm a strong values person. I, I really want to uh, associate myself with people that are, you know, better than me, that are going where I want to go, you know, all of those things. And I think it can be a game changer. So yeah, having that control over my paycheck really empowers me to be around the people that are the most meaningful. Yeah, I also say that I'm not knocking anybody specifically, but there are times in a W-2 career where you're gonna be asked to do things that you think are in kind of the gray area. And uh, the mm. Supreme Court just legislated on the opioid case in West Virginia specifically, right. where like right. 40 million pills were shipped to a state with 3 million people in a five-year time period. And you can right. imagine the amount of pressure those drug reps got to make sure that yeah. they were continuing to write prescriptions for those pills. And that might be yep. a situation that you agree with or don't agree with, but it certainly seems right. like a great situation to me. And if you don't have that financial freedom, you're almost kind of submissive to following what that uh, company needs for that area. It's a great analogy. What a powerful, powerful analogy. You're right. Yeah. He who controls or she who controls your, uh, your finances uh, make the rules, right? Maybe that's the golden rule in some respects. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What is it? So your last one is freedom of purpose. What do you think Amy's purpose is on this planet? Ooh. That's, I love that question. If you know the answer, let me know. Cause I'm looking for it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I think, uh, I think hope and encouragement. Um, when I was born, my parents took me home from the hospital and were told that I would live to be 16, maybe 18 years old. Uh, which is wild. I, you know, you think about the early 1980s and it almost makes me tear up because my parents, of course, you know, <laughs> hard to keep hope. But my goodness, I'm 41 years old doing things that I never imagined I could do. And I love to be able to tell my story to show people that even if the facts in front of you or what you're told either by medical professionals or mentors or, you know, voices that aren't helpful in, in, in your world for whatever reason, it doesn't mean that you can't defy the odds or do the impossible or follow your dreams. You're put here for a purpose and you have a, um, a calling in your heart. Um, and that's true. So you, you get to follow that and, and prove everybody wrong. So hopefully I'm a little bit of encouragement uh, with my existence here on this planet to show that to people that all things are possible. In the year and a half that I've been doing the podcast, you are one of the most infectious people that I've had on the show <laughs> so far. So I certainly think oh. that you've met that purpose. But oh, if somebody was out cute. there 
trying to figure that out for themselves, what kind of guidance would you give them to help them clearly define what their purpose is? I love that. You know, I think there is a gift of the people that are in our lives. You know, not everyone speaks truth to us or speaks helpful information, but purposely talking to and having conversations with people uh, that you trust, that live lives and have values that you um, align with and asking them what they see in you, because we all have blind spots, right? I'm guilty of it myself. You know, I'm with myself all day long. You're with yourself all day long. And we're just living who we are. Sometimes it takes voices of people um, that are like-minded and that are encouraging to really help us see you know, how we help people or what, what we do well or our patterns that we may not see of our goodness in this world. So I think having mentors, peers, uh, and people that you trust help guide you through that can be a very strong positive uh, in determining your purpose. I'm glad you said that because that is true. All of us live inside of our own head and we know our own weaknesses. And because we know our own weaknesses, we don't even know our own strengths and our talents sometimes. And it takes yes. someone else ask, asking someone else, like, what is my talents? What are my talents? What do you think I'm really good at? And you, you'll uncover talents that you're really good at that you never even knew you had. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, we all have blind spots, positive and negative and <laughs> trusted people can help us with both. So I love that you said that. Um, one of the things I've heard you say, too, is that you had um, trouble growing up planning for the future because it was so uncertain and, and sometimes a little bit difficult to see. What does the next 10 years look like for Amy? Oh, gosh. I love that question. You know, the next 10 years, my husband and I have a ton of charitable goals. Um, I have been on the receiving end of strangers, acquaintances, healthcare professionals, just random people that have poured into my life to make me healthy, uh, to encourage me, to support me. And I cannot wait to be able to do that for other people. So um, I mentioned we're in Los Angeles. There's an after school program called the Heart of LA. My husband grew up in East Los Angeles um, and knows what it's like to have two working parents, socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged. And I think we all agree, children are just the most precious and they don't get to decide where they're born or who their family is or any of that. Um, and so being able to give um, in an outlandish way to charities uh, and impact lives is, is really motivating us in the work that we do in the real estate space. Um, real estate's just a vehicle, right? It's not an end goal for us. Obviously, having those five freedoms, that's great. You can take care of those pretty easily and replace you know, your monthly expenses, uh, or excuse me, replace your income uh, to cover those monthly expenses through real estate. So we like to look at the above and beyond that. And what are we going to do to impact this world, to leave a legacy and to fulfill our purpose here on this planet? Yeah. I like to say money is a tool. Money can be a tool for bad, but money can also be a tool to pursue the passions and the purpose that you have in life. So I'm so happy to hear that you're giving that back. Thank you. Oh, it's great. It's the best feeling. Well, I want to shift us now into our last round. We're calling this the five toppings. Our first one is, what is your favorite book or what is a book you've read recently that's given you a paradigm shift? The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Everett Griffin. It's a, it's a big one. It's, a, it's an intimidating, long-looking book and it starts slow. But my goodness is studying monetary history and understanding the monetary system never been more important than it is now. So um, I encourage everyone to read it. I've read it about five times myself over the past 10 years, and I'm kind of blown away how, you know, it sounded a little interesting in 2010 when QE started or 20, you know, 2009. And as things have continued to progress, I'm going, oh my gosh, this is stranger than fiction. So it informs everything we do in business and personally, um, as hyperbolic as that may sound, but it's so important. Very, very dense book, but it is definitely <laughs> worth the read. Yes, it is. It is. Our second one is, I believe that the person you become 10 years from now is directly correlated to the habits that you have and the things that you do every single day. What are some of the habits that you have? Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. Um, if you're anything like me, you shoot out of bed, super excited to get to work. It is so hard for me to discipline myself to do what's outlined in that book of meditate, exercise, uh, do some affirmations, visualize my goals. Ooh. I mean, it's important work, but it is so hard for me to do. But my gosh, it sets the tone for the day in a way almost nothing else can. So those habits are imperative. Um, and yeah, I do them even on vacation, on weekends, because I've come to understand that our brain and our subconscious is really nice and kind of still present right when we wake up so we can program our brain and set our sights on 
our goals and what we want our day to look like. Yeah. And if it, if that seems like a lot to anyone out there, I would encourage you just to establish some sort of routine because what yes. I've noticed is like a little bit of a routine will help kick off your morning and put you in the right spot. So perfectly said. That's right. Yeah. Something is, is definitely better than nothing. And yeah, you don't want to be intimidated by it. Yep. Yep. Take control of the day. Don't let it control you. Our third one is what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? The best piece of advice I've ever received. I think find people that are like-minded and surround yourself with people who are where you want to be. We are such social creatures. You think back on you know, what we know about anthropology and human history. We used to be very tribal. And in order to be in the group, we had to kind of signal that we should be a part of it. So whether that's acting like people, adopting the same habits, thinking like them. And our brain really is still the same now. So if we surround ourselves with with people that are where we want to go, we will naturally, uh, with less effort, start to become uh, who they are as well. So I think it's really powerful. It's changed my life. Yep. And make sure they're where you want to be, not where you've been, I think, too. That's it. Yeah. 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 Our fourth one is what are you most proud of in your life? <clears throat> I'm proud of the example that I set for my cousins. Uh, I'm an only child. No shocker, I have a genetic disease. We didn't want to have others <laughs> with, with it in my family, but my mom was the second of 10 children, a uh, big Irish Catholic family, and I've got cousins just, they're still being born. There's a ton of us, we roll deep. Um, and most of them are younger. <laughs> All of them are younger than me, except for one. And um, I just love showing them that, you know, you can do great things in this world with integrity uh, and with purpose and give to others. And um, yeah, live a life that truly aligns with your values um, and uh, your relationship with God. Love it. Love it. Well, our last one is, if you could sit down and eat a bowl of ice cream with anyone dead or alive, who would it be and why? <sighs> Should have prepared for this. This is, this is such an incredible, incredible, incredible question. <sighs> Let's see. What would I do? I would pick, uh, I think, Christopher Columbus. I don't, I, I don't. I don't think I would have it in me to do what he did. And I just think, oh, geez, just fascinating to understand the obstacles he had to go through to, to get funding for this crazy idea he had to, to sail across the world. And, um, you know, obviously I'm not saying everything he did was, was great, um, but still a fascinating story, living a life that I just can't even fathom. And I love being around people that are different than me and, and understanding how they think. We're going to chat offline around a story about that, but <laughs> okay, cool. Amy, <laughs> Fantastic conversation. If anybody wanted to reach out to you and learn more about you, where's the best place we could point them? Yes, silviscapital.com. Hopefully you'll put the spelling in the show notes because I know it's a, it's a little bit of a weird one to spell. But yeah, that's my website. You can reach out to me there. Uh, would love to talk to you, get to know you. Uh, I'm one of those people that just, uh, you probably can't tell, loves to talk to people. So <laughs> reach out, let's chat, let's get to know each other. Let me know how I can help you. Awesome, sounds good. Yes, we'll leave that in the show notes. And thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. This was a delight. Thank you for listening to Ice Cream with Investors. If you like what we serve you here, it would mean the world to me if you would like, subscribe, and leave a review on your favorite podcast app.